Well, we've got a bit of a curio here. I'm uh, set up ready for a game of Clash of Empires. It's uh, on the Austro-Prussian War of 1866. It is a board game. It comes in this box. Um, Battles in the Bohemian Mountains, Initial Confrontations. And it's by Total Fighting Power Games from 1984. Uh, now, I don't think uh, the company continued beyond their initial idea with Total Fighting Power, but it is an, an, an original idea, and it's one I like very much. Essentially, you need a whole tabletop, so it's not a board game where you just use up part of a tabletop. But it's not a miniatures game, because you get these flats. They're very nice, chunky, uh, heavy cardboard flats. See, they have a depiction of the infantry, their name, the number of figures they represent, the picture of their flag here. Uh, you have the Prussians and lurking over there in the shadows are the Austrians. And uh, I'll just bring one out to show you. They are a lot smaller and it's interesting that they're this face because um, the doctrine of the time was that the Austrians advanced into combat in column, uh, according to to this game system. Uh, I don't know much about it, but uh, I think it's interesting because it, what you have is, and the, and the Prussians advanced in line, so um, they're in long expanse of lines, and the Austrians are, are more kind of bunched up in these thick column formations. Um, I'll, I'll talk about more what the bits represent, but essentially what you get in the box is you get a core of, of each side. Um, so that's two divisions and um, each division has, uh, um, for the Prussians it's two brigades and they have, uh, and then you have the core uh, and each division has its own um, cavalry and artillery. So cavalry and artillery and a, a Jaeger battalion, uh, six battalions in each brigade, and so six battalions in each brigade, two divisions, and then you have a core, the general, his headquarters, I lost one of the chits there, um, corps artillery and core cavalry. So um, battalion of cavalry for each. 560 cavalry for each division <coughs> so that's and that so that's different configuration for the prussians you see i've set them up like this um like these ones are marching in columns so they're not prepared for battle these ones are prepared for battle they will be marching forward in line the prussians are slightly different uh, sorry the austrians are slightly different you get the headquarters which has its which has uh, two large batteries of guns and a uh, Magyar cavalry. And then um, it doesn't have divisions. You just have one, two, three um, yeah, uh, battalion, uh, brigades, sorry, with six bat battalions each. And then you get also, you get, if you can see that, just trying to get away from the glare, that there's um, three battalions of cavalry in a, slums cavalry brigade so uh, their corps doesn't have divisions it just has four brigades five brigades sorry i've got there's another one reserved right at the back there so four brigades of infantry and a brigade of cavalry whereas the prussians have two uh two divisions in the corps with two brigades of infantry each and one battalion of cavalry each and attached guns so um, and one Jaeger battalion each and each, in each division but the Austrians get a Jaeger battalion with each brigade so that's significantly more Jaegers they have those light troops now uh, what else do you get in the box really get the rules that's a very slim booklet doesn't have page numbers but there's a uh, 23 cases and the rules are written in a so not conversational style, but just an easy style. They are um, somewhat case numbered, at least in paragraphs. And they're quite easy to understand. I mean, they are easy to understand. There's a slight different concepts involved, but 
uh, especially if you set things out and see how the cores and things are laid out, it's easy to see what's going on. Um, you get unit index sheets, so you, you will count losses on here, and also orders. Orders are given at the start, they can be changed. You have the game turn. The, term, the game can last up to four turns. Each turn has four bounds. Essentially, that's four moves and fights with a chance of changing to some emergency order change um, in the middle. Otherwise, you have to wait for the next, uh, after four bounds, to change orders. Um, you get some cardboard cutouts. These are just uh, thin cardboard for um, towns, villages, road. I've got the, a basic scenario here. So you've just got a road by neatly bisecting. You've got um, some woods there and you've got a hill there. In the box you get some more woods, some more towns, some more roads, another hill. Um, and you get lots of chits for representing things like units of halt in disorder and so forth. And then these which are the all important impulse chits. And uh, this combines with the diceless combat is what the game is all about. There's a um, quick reference sheet here and the back of the quick reference sheet there. And then there are five scenarios. Um, I'm on scenario two. The first scenario, and all of them are recommended on the four foot by six foot table, which is, is what this is. Um, you couldn't make it smaller unless you use different figures or, you know, half sized, made up your own um, units there. Uh, the first thing you know is just a basic division against um, a few brigades. Um, this one and there, it's hypothetical. This one's also hypothetical, so it's a core against the core. So that's what you get in the box: one core against one core. And then there's three more based on historical encounters. There's um, an expansion set, um, which gives you oops, a whole other bunch of units. I think that's two more core in there. Um, and some more scenarios, and it gives you an operational um, sort of campaign to play out. Um, the total fighting power system extended to two more games, Iron and Fire on the American Civil War, um, and to the Shocked Army on the Spanish Civil War. So interesting enough, it was brought up into the um, uh, sort of... Um, modern rather than postmodern combat. Um, I forget the unit scale. I think the unit scale is about the same for here, so you've got battalions. But for here, you're moving whole. E each one of these is, is a whole division, if my memory serves me collect correctly. I haven't played that one, and I haven't played this one. I'm very interested in all three of them. This was the first one I got, and as soon as I discovered it, I because it's a... Uh, a, because it's miniatures type, I, I love this sort of great big expanse of manoeuvring, plus you've already got your, you don't have to buy loads of figures, but also the diceless combat really intrigued me, and uh, so I got that, found out there was more, and I quickly got the others, but there's one thing which, although in theory this, I, I love this game, in practice there's one thing which really kind of lets it down for me, and that is... Um, Oh, I'll get to that in just a minute. I'll just detail some of the last um, components. So you get, like, uh, each side gets three of these sticks. One has the effect to find it's different for the Prussians. The Prussian needle gun doesn't reach as far as the Austrian Lorenz rifle. So that's an interesting difference in the armies. They both have a, a movement... Um, strip there, so Jaegers and Column or Line move up to there, and then they both get a cavalry sh um, and artillery movement which stops there. Cavalry moved twice, seeing as there's only one of me here today, I stuck both cavalry ones together, so I, I, I don't need this one for now, because um, it's just me, and I'll move these out of the way. Oh, you get a lot in the boxes. It's just um, your sort of sort of standard, at least old style GMT. Old style. They're quite weighty. Um, so you get interesting. You get conflict and concepts in all of them, which gives you historical background um, to the conflict, which is nice. Notes about organisation and so forth. 
And then also something about the elements of the total fighting power, so something about the concepts, designers' notes, essentially. And you get these track records, then you get all of the units. So there's lots of stacks of those, and then you get um, some uh, terrain, so cut out there. It's the same in the American Civil War one. The other thing you get is you get a timekeeper here, so to remind you on bound one of a turn, bound two, and what you can do in it. And you can write orders in this one. In the third bound, you can write emergency impulse phase, optional emergency orders, etc. Then you get these tally sticks, these are great. So, um, playing solo, I, I had to mark the one person, one Austrian. And uh, let me see if I can pull it out. There, so that's, let's see, I'm on 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 strength, and it goes over. So you can, because you have to add up, the combat can, can make it get fairly complicated um, if you have lots of units involved. I mean, it's a very simple system, but you might have to have a lot of factors to add up. Um, and so it's really helpful to have a tally stick to help you remember. It's just a really nice, thoughtful uh, addition to the game. It's not, you know, uh, an essential component. It's just a really helpful one. Okay, my battery's low, so this might just suddenly cut out. I apologise for that if it does. So I just wanted to get to, really, what the game's about. Essentially, um, you have these impulse checks. So at the beginning, you send orders and... Okay, the Prussians have this, you have a headquarters, two divisions, and then the brigades, and the Austrians have a, a headquarters and then separate uh, brigades. Um, what you do is your headquarters has three impulses. So he will send them out. So essentially, uh, the Prussians can send one to each division, and the Austrian can only send one to three um, brigades. So... And they've got five brigades, so two will not be under orders or will not have orders changed. Rather, will not have impulses. If you have a, if you don't get an impulse, you can not advance. You can stand and fight, but you cannot sort of advance, take objectives and things like that. So you'll send them, say, the, um, the uh, Prussian corps headquarters has three of these impulses. And what he might do is he, he will send one out to 9th Division Headquarters, one out to the 10th Division Headquarters, and then he has one left, and uh, he's going to actually send two to the 9th Division Headquarters. Now, when the 9th Division Headquarters gets an impulse, he instantly generates three of his own, and then he can send them out to his units. So now he's got one from above, uh, an extra one from above, and three of his own. So he's got three, so he'll have five. Uh, so he'll have, sorry, four, and he's got five. So now he can order um, five brigades or um, uh, artillery, cavalry, and so forth like that. Or what you can, in fact, do, if everything's sort of doing what you want it to do and there's not much you need to do, you could add, say, two or three, I think it's three is the maximum impulses to one brigade, and every impulse chip you end up having you get a um, uh, you get a bonus in combat. Oh, sorry, I said that slightly wrong. So, okay, so he, so corpse has sent it to division, and an extra one. <coughs> division generates his own. Then he can use these. He sends one to um, uh, this brigade and one to to this brigade so you've got two brigades in the division and then they automatically generate five each so he can uh, order all six of those he can order all six of those and then there's three left which um as i said can be either you can uh, order the division asset separately or you could um order the jaegers or you could add extras maybe to a frontline unit to give it extra impulse. <coughs> so it happens like that. You send an impulse from the headquarters to wakes up the division. That sends its impulses, including the division, the, the corps headquarters impulse, down the line. 
and some unit somewhere is going to accumulate more maybe um, with the Austrians it's, it's not going to be so great because they have sort of more units and less impulses um, so you can see it's already modeling a more mobile army here against a more staid old-fashioned army there but they have an advantage in range and I, I, we will see how their, their fighting power works out then the other thing that makes this stand out is the fighting power uh, uh, essentially it's uh, worked out on ascendancy which I think is a differential and then depending on who you are and um, what's going to happen to you you halt or you, you have losses you get retreats general disorder etc um, and worked out due to you have your, your unit power the co cohesion of the units is it disordered etc what nationality is it what is it artillery or Jaeger are them column or line a uh, firepower factor different nationalities shock factor etc so um, the decisive point total firepower factor is um, dependent on you and how you integrate your troops and where you send your impulses so it's deterministic in that sense but you know you don't know what your enemy is doing and you have you have you put orders and then it go you go for four for bounds unless you can inject some emergency ones but then you'll have less for the next turn if i remember correctly so then the th lastly i'll speak about a thing that bothers me and then i'll stop this video unless i get cut off before then and that is in the movement, and it's a problem that comes across in many uh, miniature war games rule sets that I read. Not all of them, but some of them, especially older ones. And uh, it's that movement is basically detailed. Here's your unit. You can be in line or column. <coughs> this is the distance you move. And <coughs> it, excuse me, if you want to turn 180 degrees, that takes a whole move. So that will take a whole move. That will take a whole move. See on the back you have a route inside. And apart from that, that's it. There's no other rules for movement. So the problem comes when you're like, okay, so, and and the Austrians can go from line to column instantly. No, sorry. The Prussians, if they're moving like this in column, and then they get, get attacked to either side, they can instantly go to, to line. So there's not actually nothing to mark if a unit's in column. You just have to remember, is that in column? Is that a column going that way? Is it a line facing that way? But apart from that, how do you get from line, for instance, into column? And the best I can gather is that you would say, okay, this... We should do it from here. This fellow is in line. He can move up to there, so... I kind of swing that, I could swing that about that far, so he's kind of like halfway there, and then the next turn he could swing all the way. Okay, now he's in column. I think that's what you do, but there's nothing rules to say. You know, there's nothing rules to say. What, um, do you, can you only move straight forwards? Can you move obliquely? <coughs> so I'm assuming you can't. I'm assuming what you would do say you want to turn you would move that far on the turn and then you would move the rest of your distance um in that way <coughs> but um it's a great area and uh i spent some time sort of working out my own rules for you know turning and uh one oh, the other rule for you have for movement is there's no um stacking so and i didn't just didn't know how hard and fast that was so for example you know you can get problems where you've got um units like this and there's this one here and so you want this one to go into column the question is can he kind of go into column like that fudging it around or is it very strict will he have to t take a turn to turn around and then one, two turns to go there, and then he can move through that space. <coughs> I, I, I think, to be honest, you just have to take it really hard and fast and strict. You cannot stack at any point, 
and that the only two rules are for turning around and moving so um on those presumably on those swings so that's the way you have to do it but you know having read in some other rules sets um rules for um shrinking frontage temporarily and then it's actually you, you you wonder what's what's possible it would be nice to have that spelt out and it's the same in the other two rule sets except there's a slight more detail in the shock army one um the civil uh, 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 uh spanish civil war one which i think was the later um game that they produced so anyway so I mean, and I think it's fine. Miniatures players probably wouldn't have a problem because they're used to the conventions and how you do that. But coming from board games where you, you're used to having hexes dictating or even squares what goes on and regulating what you're facing is, it's all very clear and it's spelled out clearly. And here, I, I understand you can't pin it down exactly because you're working in a kind of a vague space with no... Um, hard and fast uh, regimentation it would still be nice to have some indication of what the general conventions are having said that you know I, I'm intrigued by the system and I haven't played it enough to really um, get any good at it so I um, know myself you know ideally I'd play through all the scenarios in this and then come back to these later on and so forth but I'll probably play one scenario of this and then get another game out and put this away for another year but I'd like to show you what's going on here because uh, it is an interesting thing especially for people that are interested in diceless combat and also for people that are interested in um, tabletop cardboard flats rather than three-dimensional miniatures that you have to paint and spend a lot of money buying and so forth this game is offering um, people who are interested in either or both of those things something and so the question is, how come it isn't more well known? I think the first um, point might be, well, it is a bit odd. You know, it's not quite a miniatures game. It's not quite a board game. Um, and it, it doesn't have dice in combat. So for two of those things, maybe it, it sort of died to death just because it was a bit different. Well, the other thing might be that it's crap. <laughs> so that, that question is left hanging. I don't think it is. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure, but as I said, I haven't played it enough to find out what the decision um, space is within it. And the setup is completely free. Um, so it's just in about the um, first six inches and you set up your units. So I just did them that, facing each other. Basic idea is, the, the, the idea of this scenario is to catch uh, Stamamits, Stamin, Staminits or something they call their made up town there. So the one who, who holds that at the end of four turns, um, 16 bounds, is the winner. I basically decided the uh, Austrians, they've got um, all their courts artillery, so their most artillery here, so that their biggest force is coming through here. The reserve um, brigade will, will be swinging up behind to take the town. These ones hopefully pushing past the town. And then we've got a spread out brigade there to cover this area and then the cavalry to cover the whole flank here the prussians decided we've got a wide open flank so they're going to push they've got essentially one division here and another division here the jaegers of um the ninth division are, are moving straight up to try and take the town as quickly as possible then um they've got supporting <coughs> um uh, sorry that's the 10th from here onwards sorry the 9th division from here onwards that's the 10th and this is the core headquarters and assets so they've got uh, the Eggers have got a battalion on either side of the road to <coughs> help defend them they'll sort of take up positions in and around the town in buff on, on this side of the hill um, <coughs> and there's uh, another battalion here the idea is to, to cover this flank whether here or to um, outside the, the woods or over there and the cavalry <coughs> to maybe sort of move out there to block any movement around there. And then this, <coughs> the 10th division, the idea is going to sweep around 
and bang like that. So hopefully that will cause enough consternation to, to disrupt the Austrians um, so that this force can be effective taking the town. Or if the Austrians get to the town first, this is, the idea is to sweep around the hill there and take them in the side. Um, that's the plan and I will record a video of the game in and after play just to show you how it plays and <clears throat> the end of the battle in case anyone would be interested in that. So there we are, that's it for a quick introduction to Total Fighting Powers Clash of Empires.